the influences of the media. Teenage savages go wild in a juvenile jungle of lust and lawlessness. A blood tide of filth threatening to pervert an entire generation of our American children. I'm Dr. Ben Litherland. And I'm Dr. Richard McCulloch. We research media audiences. And this is Ill Effects, the good podcast about bad media influences. Today's question... Did Lady Chatterley's lover deprave and corrupt your wife or servants? <laughs> uh, mean, do you have servants, Rich? Th- this is this is the topic I've been waiting for for a while. I think <laughs> uh, I've, I'm very keen to understand uh, people who are fundamentally worse human beings than me, uh, less <laughs> lower down the food chain. Um, yeah, I want to know the dangers um, of subjecting my wife and or servants <laughs> to. Filth. You're on your seventeenth servant, and they keep getting <laughs> depraved. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's another one. I've depraved another one. <laughs> Need to God lock them out of the library. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, uh, the, the the phrase "depraving your corrupt uh, your wife or servants" is it's a famous famous phrase from uh, the trial of Lady Chatterley's uh, lover, um, and it was probably the phrase that was picked up up on the time. Have you read Lady Chatterley's Lover? I have not. I don't. I've deliberately. When you chose to do this as a topic, uh, I deliberately chose to not find out too much about it. Um, I basically know the bare bones of the story. I, 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 in the sense that I know that it's a. It was a novel by D. H. Lawrence. Uh, I know that it was very controversial, particularly because of its. Um, well, the a sexual relationship between two characters, and and particularly the language used to describe that relationship, I think was considered obscene by many at the time. Um, it was early nineteen nineteen twenty eight. It is, is yeah, twenty eight. Um, and I know that there was a big obscenity trial, which actually wasn't when it first came out. That was a later thing to do with when it was published in some form in yeah. this, in this country in the UK. It was, yep, yep. We'll um, come on to that. And I and I do know who won the obscenity case, but but that is about the limit of my knowledge on this topic. So Everyone I'm, won the yeah. obscenity case. <laughs> um, so I did. I hadn't read it. Um, I'd read bits of D. H. Lawrence. Um, I hadn't read this book. Um, so I, I have read it for the podcast. Um, it's terrible. Oh, it's, really? It's a really. I I I, I didn't enjoy it at all. Oh. And we're not a literary podcast, so my opinions on D. H. Lawrence are neither here nor there. But I I, I genuinely. Um, I'll say this now, if you wanted a book to wank to, it's the worst book <laughs> you could possibly imagine. Like, genuinely, just, it's the least sexy thing I've probably oh. ever read. It's boring. I probably read it like a lot of people did at the time, that I was like, where's the sex? I'm on page 50, and no one's, no one's shagged yet. Like, what's what's happening? Right, right, right. Um so my impression of the book before I read it, I, I thought it was like a really like sexy and erotic book. There are sex scenes. Obviously, there are sex scenes. Um, the passages of the sex scenes were read out in court. Um, but yeah, no, I was I was genuinely surprised by how little sex was actually in it and the way that sort of sex was positioned in it and mm. the, the, the types of relationships. So obviously, I'm reading it through modern eyes and the, the, there's, there's an issue there. Um but yeah, it was the least depraved and <laughs> corrupt thing I've read. It turns out you can get a lot more depraved stuff on the internet. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard this. Yeah, your modern brain has been, you know, desensitized or whatever the language is. For yeah, I, I got an internet connection when I was 13 years old. I, yeah. I, I think a book from 1928 is, is possibly not going to do it for me. But that's what we're talking about today is... Um, how the book was read at the time, how it was kind of conceived about at the time, and, and other things like that. What I thought was interesting with this, so when I was looking at ideas for the podcast, I don't think I'd fully understood how important the idea of influence was for both the obscenity trial, but also the way obscenity had been in history. So I really wanted mm. to dig into that because I think there's a really interesting question there. Firstly, to consider 
books as media. I, I think they're often kind of positioned as outside of what yeah. we're talking about. But actually, books are a medium. Yep. And, you know, books books are a media as well. Uh, but also to kind of think about how influence is positioned within this. So the phrase, deprave and corrupt, comes from probably the most quoted part of the trial. And what I wanted to do to start was to listen to an extract of the trial performed by actors. I'm going to play you a clip from The Chatterley Affair, which was a BBC film um, that was produced in 2006. Uh, You've got Pip Torrens, the actor, playing Mervyn Griffith-Jones, who was the prosecutor. And it gives a short extract of the opening summary, which captures so much of what the trial was about. It was learnt earlier this year that Penguin Books proposed to publish this book, Lady Chatterley's Lover. As a result of that, the company was seen by the police. And so it comes about that you find yourselves in the jury box to give your judgment on Lady Chatterley's Lover. I quote from the Obscene Publications Act of 1959. A book is to be deemed to be obscene if its effect taken as a whole is such as to tend to deprave and corrupt persons who are likely to read it. So, does this book, might this book, deprave and corrupt anybody who might be likely to read it? And my learned friend will doubtless argue that the book is not obscene, and that even if it were, its literary merit would warrant its publication as being for the public good. Prosecution will invite you to say that this book does tend to introduce lustful thoughts in the minds of those who read it. It goes further, you may think. It sets upon a pedestal promiscuous and adulterous intercourse. It commends, indeed it even sets out to commend, sensuality almost as a virtue. It encourages and indeed advocates coarseness and vulgarity of thought and language. You may think that it must tend to deprave the mind certainly of some, and you may think of many of those persons who are likely to purchase it at the price of three shillings and sixpence. You may think that one of the ways in which you can test the book is to ask yourselves, once you have read it, this question. Would you approve of your young sons, your young daughters, because girls can read as well as boys, reading this book? Is it a book that you would even wish your wife or servants to read? (laughs) Well, let us turn now to the book itself. What do you think? Yeah, I, I can see why you picked that clip. It uh, <laughs> definitely captures captures what we're going to be talking about, I guess. Um, did you say the the actor who was playing the prosecutor is called Pip? <laughs> I did. Yeah, Pip Torrens. Do you think they did that <laughs> intentionally? Like <laughs> choose choose someone to play a complete out of touch toff <laughs> who's also got a completely ridiculous upper poor, class name. Poor Pip. Uh, no offense, I'm sure he's a lovely, no lovely to bloke. Pip. I'm, I'm sure he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> What's Pip short for? <laughs> I don't know. He's only got little legs. No? (laughs) Never mind. There'll be more of those to come through. I Um, hope not. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I guess guess the interesting thing on on a more serious note um, with regards to the stuff that we actually want to talk about in this episode. um, So you were saying before that the the concept of obscenity has this idea of influence kind of baked into it. You sort of have to demonstrate it, yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because... I don't know. I, I think I guess I'd never really thought about it much in detail before. But I, I guess when I hear the word obscenity and think about, you know, trials like this, you know, without even knowing much about the detail, I'm kind of thinking more about the stuff he's saying about conjuring up lustful thoughts in the mind and that, that just being an inherently like a morally bad thing. Or, or stuff being, you know, like vulgar language. It's just not something you say in polite conversation. That's the kind of thing I was thinking of more. But the language of depraving and corrupting is, you're right, it's, it's a lot more about influence, isn't it? Like, what does this what does this book do to people? Not just what it's making think about. Yeah. And there's a very specific reason why that language is there, um, which is something that we can talk about. So the extract that you've just watched uh, it draws on the transcript so penguin actually published the transcript from the court proceedings so that's that's word for word how it was delivered um and it captures everything that i wanted to talk about today so 
Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. Uh, you were right, published privately in 1928. Rich makes an excellent pub quiz teammate. Um, but it wasn't openly published until 1960. So it has a bit of a weird publication history. It, it, it's um, privately published uh, in, in the UK. It's, private, it's, it's published in Italy. Um, it's picked up and kind of published illegally in a couple of spots, like it's um, pirated and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it has a bit of a weird publication history. Um, but at its source, it's a story of a woman having an affair with a gamekeeper. Okay. Um, and it's... As boring as it sounds, I'm, I, I feel I feel bad. I'm already I'm giving this novel a kick in. I, I guess I should like out and out say like the gender politics of it are pretty grim to read. Like women don't feature in this novel particularly well, mm. so I think it has been picked up by you know some feminist critics have sort of argued that it's a weird book to have the prominence that it does of like this liberalizing, um, you know, free political. Um, position that it has in the kind of history of British society because it has like weirdly gross attitudes towards working class mm. people. D.H. Lawrence has been criticised since for like his politics were pretty gross. He didn't right. think working class people should have the vote. Like it's pro-fascist potentially. And I don't think that's all in the book, but it, it's right. not a particularly pleasant book to read in many ways. Um the famous extract that you just heard in terms of the trial. Um, so this is um, Penguin Books. So Penguin Books publish it. And it is a test case. So there's a new Obscene Publications Act in 1959. And the reason why it's in 1960, Penguin very, very deliberately publish it, knowing yeah. that this could potentially be one of the books that, okay. that comes up. So everyone, I think, is playing a role. Yeah. Um, and I think there's something quite interesting about that. So the trial takes place between... Um, the 20th of uh, October and the 2nd of November in 1960. Um, and in British society um, specifically, it has become this like watershed moment or it's spoken about in a lot of the sun, certainly in popular histories of um, the era. Um, it's often described as welcoming a new permissive society. Um, there's quite a famous Phil Philip Larkett poem um, with uh, the opening line, Sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. Nice. So it's seen as this, like, this is the first moment that's going to kind of um, introduce sort of free love and the hippie movement. So if, if the 1960s yeah. opens with this and ends with, you know, Woodstock, this is the, this is the kind of popular cultural history. It it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think historians often have to, you know, when they're writing like histories of a decade or something of a, a period in time, they always have to say, I'm talking about the 60s, but really the 60s sort of started in 1958 or whatever. <laughs> Whereas now they're like, this, this case is like literally 1960. It's Bang, so lucky, isn't swinging it? Swinging 60s. Yeah, Britain, absolutely. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's... Beatles. It's exactly that. And historians always have to do this thing. So it, like one of the more popular, um, you know, one of the more referenced and popular books of um, of the era, it opens with Chatterley. Um, but then like it has, to, it has to retreat and be like, well, actually, yeah, like, well, there were other books as well. Um, so there were other books published before this that possibly could have been, you know, the test case. And yeah. there's, there's other things going on. Um so it would be bad history to suggest that before Lady Chatterley's lover, sex doesn't exist and it's invented, <laughs> you know, invented at this point. But it's yeah. it's often positioned as that um, kind of a little bit. I suppose what I partly found a little bit interesting here is I don't think um, the prosecutor, I would have much in common with him. He makes a fool of himself on a couple of occasions right. during the trial. Um, I don't want to defend him per se, um, he is a bit of a blustering, you know, um, mid-20th century conservative. Um, I don't think he genuinely liked the book, regardless of what his, his, his job and role was. But I do think the wives and servants stuff is interesting because in part what he has to do is to identify influence. Or he sort mm. of has to, as part of the obscenity law, he kind of has to identify a group of people who potentially will yeah. be corrupted. He kind of has to imply what the nature of that corruption is going to be. Um, and he has to, and this is important, he has to also identify that that material is available to them. Yeah. 
it was picked up like genuinely immediately as he said it people were laughing at him the next day in the press people were writing about this line as like this out of touch ridiculous yeah, yeah, yeah. man um but it's a bit of a difficult job for him to be able to do that without you have to name the people and if you're naming people who are you going to name that's really interesting though because that's that's so familiar to like anyone who's studied any kind of like history of moral panics or anything like that it's always about this and this is obviously one of the reasons we're doing this podcast in the first place and will be a theme throughout different episodes but like this idea that if you are going to make a claim that such and such a book or film or you know musical artist or whatever is harmful in some way you have to identify not only the nature of the harm but who it's going to harm exactly you have to to identify a a group who you then make out to be excessively vulnerable for some reason either because they're a you know according to to this guy kind of like a a fair-minded the fairer sex or whatever you know that kind of thing yeah or it's often children or particularly working class children or working class people and things like that It's, it's often directed downwards isn't it those, yeah those concerns so actually he mentions young working class men more throughout the trial so the the wives mm. and servants line i don't know whether the fact that people laugh in his face when he says it means that he retreats but he mentions that's the only time he mentions wives and servants um but he mentions young working class men kind of four five six times throughout the rest of the trial um i, f- I feel like that's that's him just projecting like is he is he then worried that young working class gamekeepers are going to start trying to seduce the, we- the, the well to do yeah his wife <laughs> and maybe the stu- the servants as well maybe <laughs> who who knows who knows <laughs> almost immediately the publication of the book causes a big deal in british society everybody is talking about it um it's on the news every day it's on the front page of the press so even from the point of publication it becomes a countdown of everybody knows what's happening and everyone's quite excited about it. Um, Is it still available while the trial is going on? Yes. Right. Yes. In fact, so I've got a short clip that was from a news report from the day. So this is pre-trial on the day of the publication. And you can begin to see immediately... Um, that before this has even got the trial, that this this is event. So if you if you have a watch of this and and tell me what you think, the time now is five minutes to twelve, five minutes to zero hour. Because here in this bookshop in the heart of London, Lady Chatterley goes on sale at twelve noon sharp. So let's wait and see how the rush develops and see what happens. Take it easy. Let's do up nice. Do got plenty. Thank you. <laughs> no pictures, Thank you. One copy only. Thank you. Thank you. Ten. Thank you. One. Two One only. Only one. Excuse me, why are you buying a copy? Just to see what is about. Why do you want a copy of Lady Chatterley? A lot of fuss about it. Might as well read it. Why do you want a copy? Well, we've heard so much about it, I just want to have a look and see what it's like. How about you? Because I shall shortly be doing a course on the modern novel at university. Same How about me. you? Same You're doing the same yes. thing, are you? Excuse me, sir, why do you want a copy of Lady Chatterley? Can you tell me why? Rather exciting to read. You, because? Rather exciting to read. Exciting to read. How about you? Well, I just want to know what it's all about, that's all. Excuse me, madam, why do you want a copy of Lady Chatterley's I'm buying it for somebody else. You're buying it for somebody else. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> How about you? I just want to see what it's all about. You want to see what it's all about? How, why do you want a copy? For my wife. For your wife? <laughs> oh, man. That's amazing. I love that. I love <laughs> what, what do you I, love about it? I love everything about that. I love that it starts off with this kind of, like, the poster in the background, like, now you can read it, which is so, like, classic, um, sensationalised promotion for anything. Uh, I remember The Exorcist had a similar thing in 1973 when that came out. Um, there was like a, a great trailer for it, which I, I really loved, which didn't show any of the film of The Exorcist. It just showed it would just had the narrator going, now you too can see The Exorcist. <laughs> and, and but but not if you cover your eyes. And it was literally just a, a shot of a couple, a young couple watching the film. Yeah. And didn't show any of the film t- itself, but it was just her sort of cowering and sort of like, you know, c- cuddling into him. So this sort of implication that, you know, your sweetheart will cuddle up to you if you go and watch this film kind of thing. But yeah, I just, I love the variety of excuses and people like the, the people, like the guy who dismissively just like waves his hand, like, please, for the love of God, don't talk to me. Um, 
yeah, the the guy's little smile when he says exciting, like he's, <laughs> he's well, he's well, he's well up for it. <laughs> we'll stick that on the Instagram so you can see his face. Um, this was something that was picked up by many, many people. So that idea of wanting to see what the fuss was about that was was even outside of this clip, like more people read it. And I think would have been disappointed, actually, for the... the, yeah. the t- it is not a titillating book in the way that it's probably being pitched as. I mean, I, I, I don't want to j- jump ahead to stuff you might have planned for later, but, like, so much of this screams Fifty Shades to yeah. me. Like, it's the exact same thing where almost everyone who read it did so to see what the fuss was about and whether it was really as filthy as everyone said it was. Yeah, it, you're so right, both with the Exorcist stuff. and Like, this this is an echo through history of, yeah. like, anything that kind of is picked up as, as shocking or sexy or increasingly, yeah, like, people want to see what the fuss is all about. Um, there's a really good article by uh, Nick Thomas that does a lot of the audience research, so most of the quotes that um, uh, we're going to be talking about today are lifted from this. Um, but in a newspaper of the day, uh, somebody else read... If people just if people read it just for the sex, there's much better stuff on the market, which I enjoy because he's entirely entirely right um, and bold to say it to a journalist. He's he's right, and you could that quote could be used to describe so much, so many other like controversial like media over the years. I mean, Fifty Shades being the prime example, which was one where most people's reaction was. This is, there's not enough sex in it, like you know, and, and particularly the, <laughs> could be dirtier. I, I remember that I I, I wrote a, a piece on the on the film's reception and a few years back, and one of my favourite quotes was this person who was just like, "There's no visible genitals," like, <laughs> just like absolutely furious that like saying it was like a porn for people who shop at Marks and Spencer and you know, or, or you, you they're find, the kinkiest the people <laughs> who watch it um, shop at Marks and Spencers. Yeah, um, as with. That sort of reaction. So the people who are interested in it, um, we also get the reverse reaction. So people who haven't read it um, respond really, really badly to it. So there's a really, really famous photo, which I'll let you describe, which captures the energy of the people who were quite angry that this had been published. Can you work out what's happening here? I mean, am I, is that Mary Whitehouse or has it just looked like... That kind of it's Mig Miss Agnes Cooper. But, okay, uh, yeah. There's oh a... no, Mary Whitehouse wouldn't be that old at this point. <laughs> That's quite unfair to Mary Whitehouse, although I'm not that willing to be particularly fair to her. Um, but yeah, it looks like a, a book burning. Basically, there's a, it's a, a shot of a uh, of a street, terraced houses. Um, there's a, a elderly lady stood in the foreground with uh, three men stood behind, and there's a something a flame on um, a little wall in front of them. Which I, yeah, I'm guessing a the book or multiple copies of the book yeah it's exactly that so it's miss agnes cooper she's 62 i've just spotted a rhino in the background as well well she's so she's burning (laughs) it in front of the bookshop so the the lads in the background are the people who've just sold her the book which they're quite amused by right i suppose the rhino is part of the yeah bookshop i i hadn't i had seen that and i hadn't actually consciously kind of thought about that Hmm. um so cooper's a a former missionary in the belgian congo if you want a sense of where her politics are coming from um she'd not read the book but was convinced it was evil i mean this is this is just Every moral panic ever, like the, yes. pe- the people who get the most, the most outraged, um, the quickest seem to be the ones who haven't actually read the thing or watched the thing. Yeah, it's yeah. So she's brought her own little metal dish and uh, her own fire tongs because she didn't want to touch it. Um, <laughs> she brought them from home. <laughs> she brought a fire tongs. Or she just carries them around with her on yeah. a day to day basis in case she finds an evil book that she wants to burn. So this was this was widely publicised at the side at, 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 at the time. And I think both of all of this is is part of the reception and the noise that's attached to just the publication of the book. So this is um pre trial. As the trial is going on, it, it just generates so much noise from all angles. Um, particularly from the anti side, there is a lot of amazing, amazing quotes in this Nick Thomas article. 
So I'm going to try and do some accents now because uh, I've, <laughs> I've, I've got a, a drama degree, which I, I don't put to use very often these days, um, and I've got one accent. Um, so you're going to have to help me out. I'm intrigued what accents you've got. But we've got some quotes that are taken from letters, newspaper reports, and other things at the time. So I've known you for about seven years, Ben. I don't think I've ever heard you do an accent other than your own. <laughs> um, well, so just, I'm excited. To, I mean, I, I, I'm, whatever's going to come out of your mouth, I'm excited. <laughs> I don't want to build it up, but it's it's going to be really, really exciting. There's a reason why I've kept it from you for, okay. for seven years. Awesome. Um, I'm going to make you go first, though. So do you okay. want to do you want to role play being Miss Diffley? So this is a letter sent to the Home Secretary of the time. So she's going to be very posh. She's a she's a yeah. So she's a you RP know, kind of yeah posh middle aged woman. I suspect. Okay. <clears throat> da 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 da. da. <laughs> Millions of young people will have their development arrested and go into factory services and other employments full of degradation and taste. There is no single reason I can think of with which to defend obscene publications for the masses. Therefore, you really must do something to hinder this horrible trend, please. That was good. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm concerned now. <laughs> I know I've got to do an accent. Um, so this is a letter that was sent to the Telegraph and Argus. So this is uh, Maurice Kennedy. The danger to Britain from Russian rockets is trifling compared with the spirit of indiscipline and moral decay which is pervading the country today. Unless challenged and defeated, the Lady Chatterley verdict will be a decisive stage in the breakup of the Britain we have known. <laughs> I'll be honest, Ben. I didn't listen to a single word you just said because I was, I was so fixated on the accent. Can um, can we do all of the podcasts in that voice from now on? I think we should. Yeah, I think we should. There, there should be a there should be an accent section. We should get a jingle. Wow. I mean, those are some good quotes. Yeah. And last, but I, I don't know. I feel like I've gone all in on the, on the first accent. Um, there was another letter sent by Guy Daniels to Alan Lane. So I love that he's signing it, which is which is brilliant. Uh, Alan Lane was the founder of Penguin Books, and it includes the quote, The view of any self-respecting young person in the land is that you ought to be hanged for what you have done. <laughs> um, and I, 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 go on. I just, do people who say things like this, are they having a laugh? Like, I mean, are they, do, do, genuinely, like, I'm not even joking. Like, like, I, I mean, obviously it's kind of performative, right? There's an element of that. It has to be, right? Some, like like the, the lady on the photo we just saw before who's burning the books. Burning a book has no impact on anything other than to, to say, look, I'm the kind of person who finds this disgusting. Yeah, you're making a display of yourself. And clearly uh, that's what's going on here. But I, I, I'd love to know, like, do, does anyone genuinely believe that? Someone should be hanged? Yeah. Or, 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 or genuinely thinks... The, the, the danger, the danger of, of <laughs> literal nuclear rockets from Russia, is is not as significant as the moral decay epitomised by books that have a little bit of stuff about wanking in. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, well, what what interests me? So Richard Hoggart, who's one of the people who uh, defends the book on in 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 court, he gets sent literal shit. And I kind of, I'm always torn between this like idea of like, I'm protecting good old fashioned English decency by <laughs> shitting in an envelope <laughs> and posting it to some fella who likes a book I didn't like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the kind of thought process is there. Because the, cause surely there's a, I mean, I've, I've, as someone who's never shat into an envelope or posted shit through a letterbox. <laughs> I imagine the risk of getting it all over your hands is quite high in those circumstances. I've always been intrigued as to whether, yeah, how what the process is as to whether you go straight into the envelope or whether mm. you do it somewhere else. There's, there's stages to it and it, 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 you know, there's a level of planning that I respect and for shit in, in an envelope. Exactly, and particularly for, for our, um, you know, North American listeners, international listeners who, you know, might have mailboxes rather than letterboxes. Some British letterboxes have very stiff mechanisms, and that's not a euphemism, but they, 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 it's very difficult to get, you know, packages and things through them to the extent where I would worry for the, the sender yeah. posting something that's not entirely solid. 
It's also against the law to post uh, to post filth. <laughs> Actually, in in Royal Mail's terms of service, I I mean, this was like 20 years ago, I actually looked up there, like, you know, laws about stuff you could and couldn't send in the post, and and one of them was filth, (laughs) which, by which I think they meant, like, dirt rather than pornography or something, but... Why not both? Yeah. To understand how we get here, then, so we've got the publication of the book, we've got the trial, we've got no one talking about anything else, we've got people posting shit, we've got people burning books, we've got all of this drama. So to understand how we get there in 1960, I'm just going to send us back um, about 100 years uh, to 1857. So to really understand the trial, we need to understand this idea of what an obscene publication is. We need to understand the idea of obscenity. Um, And to certainly understand this idea of depraving and corrupting, there's quite a specific history where we go from mid-19th century to mid-20th century, and there's something interesting there. So the Obscene Publications Act was first published in 1857, and it was quite narrow initially in its focus. Um, So initially it was published um, very specifically that books that were written for the single purpose of corrupting the morals of youth and of a nature calculated to shock the common feelings of decency. So you indicated this earlier, actually. The initial obscene publications is more about text in some ways. It's Mm. text and context. Um, Famously, it didn't define what was and wasn't obscene, and it had quite a narrow focus of really there was a pornography market at the time in the 1850s. That That's really all it was aimed at. Um, but it becomes an issue, this this kind of lack of clarity about how you then define what obscenity is. Um, about a decade later, in 1868, uh, Justice Alexander Cockburn uh, in The Crown versus Hicklin uh, updated the Obscenity Act uh, to include, and this is quite a famous, um, the Hicklin um, rule, the Hicklin law becomes quite a famous interpretation of what obscenity is. Um, So that follows, the test of obscenity is this, whether the tendency of the matter is to deprave and corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences and into whose hands a publication of this sort may fall. It shifts obscenity to reception Mm. rather than authorship. I don't want to take the piss out of anybody's name, but somebody called Cockburn... (laughs) Do it, doing a an obscenity act. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to leave it out there. I'm just it's, saying. it's like the, you know, the, the, the really incredibly, outrageously homophobic conservative politicians that, and then they're found, you know, engaged in acts that <laughs> they've been speaking about for years and things like that. It's just his name. I don't think his cock did burn. <laughs> I, 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 well, <laughs> do we do we know that? How, how deep did your research go, Ben, for this episode? <laughs> Um, what I also really, really love about the Hicklin law is, so it's specifically, the law is about a pamphlet. So it's an anti-Catholic pamphlet that was distributed in the 1860s. Um, and the title of the pamphlet was The Confessional Unmasked, showing the depravity of the Romish priesthood, the iniquity of the confessional, and the questions put to females in confession it's both an anti it's a hyper protestant anti-catholic tract but it's also fucking filthy so what what was in that pamphlet so i couldn't find it to read it but apparently it's summaries of women in confession giving very very descriptive summaries of their own sex lives wow I think this is a kinkier and easier to wank to publication <laughs> than Lady Chatley's Lover. I'm, I'm just saying it. I just it sounds wild. Like that sounds incredibly, incredibly kinky. Yeah, particularly for 1868. Particularly for 1868. Yeah. But genuinely published it is it is a religious text, and it had been controversial for a couple of years at that point. So was the was the problem then the. Um, the nature of the, descript- the descriptions of sex more so than the anti-Catholicism. 
I believe so, but it was a a, a very hyper controversial thing politically as well as socially. Mm. Um, so this is there's a couple of test trials in between this, but this is it's important specifically because this description of obscenity is what follows through up until 1959 when they update um, the Obscenity Act. Um, so the, the the sort of Hicklin test is, is really, really interesting. But I was just like, wow, what what is this? What, there's, there's, there's a lot going on in yeah, that yeah, title. Yeah. But I mean, it's. It, I guess. I guess a lot of stuff around um, obscenity, and I guess moral outrage generally. A lot of it historically has come from, uh, you know, religious circles. So I suppose a pamphlet like that is going to be doubly offensive, <laughs> isn't it? You know, I suppose so. What happens almost immediately? So once we've got this idea that obscenity is about depraving and corrupting particular groups of people, is almost immediately that creates a very weird gap in British law. Um, So there's a couple of interesting examples that illustrate what a couple uh, of academics, Ian Hunter, David Saunders and Doug Doug Old Williamson, um, describe as variable obscenity. And variable obscenity at its most basic is that obscenity is very specifically about who you're actually selling stuff to. So it's not really about the text. It's about the availability of the text to certain groups of people. So to illustrate this, um, quite famously, um, there's a fella called Henry Vizzatelli um, who was twice prosecuted for publishing, and this is the important bit, affordable translations of Emile Zola's novels. Right. Um, and the prosecution very specifically makes the case that you've been publishing them in cheap paperback. These are freely yes. available. Anyone can pick these up. Um, there are multiple examples of these books being published in the original French, which aren't prosecuted. Um, mm. It's only the posh people who yeah, speak yeah, yeah. French. Uh, and then very, very famously, about a decade later, somebody publishes... Um, a subscription-only hardback copy of the exact same publication uh, on handmade paper uh, and published in Japanese villain, uh, which were only available <laughs> by subscription. So they're expensive, therefore they're not obscene. They don't get right, prosecuted, right, right. but the, the, the paperback versions do. I mean, this is very reminiscent of like the, the pe- penny dreadfuls and things like that, where it's like it's like the, the 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 really bad thing about them is not strictly the content. It's oh my god, they're so cheap that that poor people might get their hands on them. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that Penguin does that like Penguin is famous for at the time is their um, their pitch as to what they do as a publisher is to make literature available for everyone. So quite famously, a paperback. Novels should be the same price as a pack of cigarettes. That's that's their initial pitch, and it's attached to you know W. H. Smith on British train stations. But the idea that the working man can walk up and make a decision right. between a pack of cigarettes, which is then affordable, yep. or a, a paperback at the time. Um, clearly, the Obscenity Act is responding to bigger social things that are taking place, particularly in sort of like the height of uh, Victorianism. Um, the most obvious being mass literacy. Mm -hmm. So the reason why you have to put in an obscenity act in um, the 1850s and not 200 years earlier is because people can read now. So there's a conservative newspaper. Again, this is, you know, whenever you read up on the obscenity act, this is one of the quotes that academics always use. So this was a conservative newspaper editorial in response to the Visitelli trial that took place. Uh, Until what is called education had become nearly universal, the possibilities of harm, which were latent in printed material, had not attracted public attention. The children of the lower classes read with difficulty and did not read for amusement. This has all been changed. We have now to face an agent of moral corruption, no longer confined to persons willing and ready to be corrupted, but obtruding itself on everybody." Mm. Like you say, that's quite a long-standing thing. But the idea of, you know, oh, people can read now, and if they can read, we need to be able to restrict what's available to them. So yeah. the idea that this isn't going to corrupt me, because I'm a smart, intelligent, middle-class I mean, person, yeah. this is going to corrupt 
other people. That's always the argument, isn't it? It's always the argument. I watched it and I found it disgusting. But imagine if somebody, <laughs> you know, less educated than me, uh, less middle class than me. Exactly. <laughs> watched it. Exactly. So one way around um, obscenity at the time was just to publish, you know, limited editions, high prices, lavish paper, um, expensive bindings. All of those things could protect you from publication. But if you make it a mass market book or if you make it available in bookshops on the high street, then all of a sudden you're open to this interpretation. Clearly, a law written in 1850, um, publishers by the 1950s are frustrated by this. We're in post-war Britain. At this point, we're way beyond the kind of anxieties around um, mass literacy and other things like that. So, Quite early in the 1950s, there begins to be conversations about updating the Obscenity Act. Sorry, hang on. You're telling me that that act was not updated for 100 years? That act wasn't updated till 100 years. So we're, 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 wow. we're going into living memory. So we're making a jump. All of those things. Oh, which, hell. as we've kind of established, D.H. Lawrence writes Lady Chatley's Lovers in 1928. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it is not published until 1960 in its complete format. And that gives you that that 30 year time frame, even at the time. So, like I say, I think D.H. Lawrence probably is a piece of shit, if I'm completely honest. But he kind of writes the book. He was sort of working at the margins of the Obscenity Act in the UK. Interesting enough, we could probably do a different episode on this because America takes some of this stuff. Um, So it was similarly not available in America. But the way that America deals with it is a very different way to the way Britain deals with it. Mm. So even in the 50s, when Britain is starting to try and have conversations about the Obscene Publications Act, in America, it very much becomes a question of freedom of expression. Mm. Britain doesn't have much legal... Freedom of expression is rarely actually the lens through which laws are changed. Um, Even, you know, today, in terms of censorship laws, that's actually not the discussion that takes place. So. Similar law, the the Hicklin test is actually applied in America for the same time frame, but it, it changes in America in a slightly different way. But yeah, absolutely, it stands up as the as the law around the policing of literature for a hundred years, way into the twentieth century. There can't there can't be that many laws and acts that stand for that long without being changed at all. I think most laws stand for that long. Like, do, do, I think we still got... Laws the, about cultural stuff, though. Well, moral, maybe, maybe not stuff. around kind of cultural stuff. But, mm. you know, obscene publications um, from 1959 is still in play today. Mm. Um, so you could technically still yeah, be taken yeah. to court. So we're, we're kind of fast approaching that. Um, the Act is updated in 1959. So publishers get together with, um, at the time, the sort of reforming Labour Party and other groups of people. Um, and they update it. They don't update it. Obscene publications still exist, um, which is quite an interesting thing. And as um, you've kind of indicated, actually, that still stands for quite a long time. Um, So it doesn't get rid of the idea of obscene publications at all. And it actually keeps much of the stuff about corruption and depravity in the act. Yeah. The main thing that changes in 1959 is that it's updated so that the whole piece of literature can be read as a whole or scientific literature or other things like that so again historically stuff had been prosecuted um because it was a science textbook but it had you know pictures or descriptions Ah. in um the, the the main thing is and i'll quote from from the change is that an article should be deemed to be obscene if its effect is if taken as a whole such as tend to deprave and corrupt persons so this is really interesting because because Actually, I don't have much knowledge of the legal history of the Obscene Publications Act, but I do know that there has been that that, the discourse of obscenity, like the way people talk about it um, and particularly like, you know, centre right and and right leaning kind of conservative newspapers and politicians well into the 90s and into the 21st century still use that same that exact same language. I remember Crash, the uh, David Cronenberg film, one of the things that I think it was Alexander Walker um, said, said of it. Um, it might not have been him. Uh, but anyway, um, one of the, the main things that was said about that film was that it was, it was a film beyond the bounds of depravity. Mm. So that language of depravity is still there. And what you've just said about how the whole context is important. I would say that's a good addition to the law because I 
do believe that you know you shouldn't just take one little thing from a text and and act like that's not part of something bigger. But people do that all the time, and still yeah. today, when they're complaining about something being harmful or obscene, or they you don't see the language depraved as much these days, but you know, um, offensive or um, disgusting or something yeah. like that. Um, they they often do that thing where they they say they're not they don't really care about the wider context of the piece. They go look at that scene there, yeah, or look at that lyric there, or whatever. Absolutely. So that is essentially what the trial does is the trial puts realistically the whole book into a conversation about you know what does the what's the literary merit of the book what are the narratives what are the themes mm. so it's a fascinating point in history where it becomes essentially a university seminar where they invite and um, so the prosecution doesn't invite anyone the defense invites 35 people uh, including bishops, it includes um, people from the world of literature, literary critics, and it includes, um, which I always love this particular aspect, um, two academics who are really, really influential for what follows, particularly in British media and cultural studies. Yeah. Uh, Raymond Williams, um, and probably most famously, Richard Hoggart. Um, Richard Hogger, in particular, was quite widely applauded for his performance. It's quite an interesting reading of the book. I think he's later, after the fact, said, "Yeah, I, I, I overplayed some aspects of it." Mm. But it's a it's an interesting conversation and it's an interesting dialogue. So we've, we've returned to the BBC film. Um, we've got a young David Tennant. Just just about David Tennant when he's about to become Doctor Who. So this is from 2006. So it's, it's about that time. Um, who plays Richard Hoggart. And I've got a, an extract which I think captures aspects of, of the type of defence that were kind of put in place um, on the new, obs- uh, new Obscenity Act. The word for the sexual act. We have no word in English for it. There is neither a long abstraction or an evasive euphemism and we're constantly running away from it or dissolving into dots in a passage like this. Lawrence wanted us to say this is what one does. In a simple, ordinary way, one fucks. With no sniggering or dirt, one fucks. Nice. Yeah, and again, that scene is quite a big moment that you've got a academic, a modern, you know, academic who's interested in modern English literature saying fuck at the trial, defending it as a whole artwork. So everyone, when they um, the defence puts question to them, the whole point is that it wants to kind of discuss this mm. as a literary work. Before I'd read it, I kind of thought that was bullshit. I thought that actually they were going to be blagging it a little bit. It turns out, once you read it, that kind of interpretation is right. Like, um, there's a, I think there's 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 a, about twenty sex scenes, give or take a few. Oh wow, um, a few. I, you know, I can't remember exactly. I've not counted them, but there's about twenty, I think, during the whole book. But they're they're barely a page, and they're not particularly sexy, if I'm completely honest. Um, D. H. Lawrence doesn't know what a clitoris looks like. Quite famously, <laughs> he gets a lot of stuff wrong about women's bodies. It's a very not particularly sexy summary of what a, 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 an affair could look like, um, and it's quite moral. Like the the whole book is this mediation on relationships in the modern industrial society, um, and the prosecutor tries to pitch the argument that the in between the bits of the sex that's just filler really what people are doing is just buying this book it's the longest driest most dull filler that you could possibly imagine right right. and they ask the jury to read the book before the trial so i suspect there's something interesting going on uh in terms of they must be going oh it probably wasn't yeah the most sexy thing that's ever happened the proverbial porno where they just spend the entire film what fixing actually fixing the fridge <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah and then there's like a voiceover about like what it means to be a washing machine in contemporary <laughs> society and you're like why is no one shagging this is terrible <laughs> it's exactly that Beyond the trial itself, this was particularly interesting to me and I thought it would be interesting to you. The debate about 
what the actual influence is in the trial is actually pretty limited from both prosecution and defence. Um, so the de- defence team takes the argument, and I think because it is this test case, I think they want to test, OK, we're going to make the argument for this being a work of literature and we're going to analyse it as a contemporary work of literature. More so in America, people start to ask the types of questions that you and I would ask of contemporary media research, mm. which is actually, well, what are people doing? Well, I, I, was, I was just going to say, because I was surprised when I saw that clip of David Tennant there, that actually his art, you know, like knowing who Richard Hoggett is and, you know, one of the founders of British cultural studies and all that kind of stuff. Um, his his argument there is pretty, you know, literary centric, right? It's it's he's talking about what does Lawrence, what does D. H. Lawrence want us to, to yeah. think about this? It's not about I don't know the the cultural significance necessarily. Yeah, Richard Hoggart's work uh, I enjoy, but Richard Hoggart quite famously is um, he wants the working classes to read high literature. Right. He, he's he's a pivot, I think, between an older model of. British literary criticism and the cultural studies that follows in the 80s and 90s. But his famous book, The Uses of Literacy, um, is quite sneering about the new popular cultural forms and the effects. I I don't think he's necessarily against Mm. the idea that things can be bad for people. I think his argument is that this book isn't one of them, that this this book meets the criteria for high literature, therefore it shouldn't be prosecuted in fact he's actually asked by the prosecutor are there books that you would consider um available you know that you Mm. would actually um censor on the grounds of the obscenity act and he's like absolutely i think there's loads of books that meet those criteria this just isn't one of them right and he's right did he name what they were he didn't name. (laughs) i've I've got this pamphlet about catholic (laughs) wives right um he's just going into your local wh smith (laughs) i've got a list of books that are are kinkier than uh, lady chatley's lovers there is research at the time. So the sorts of questions that to me would be interesting from an effects model is to come at it from the audience first mm. and that the text is kind of background. Or put another way, like what actually is the depravity and corruption that's being claimed? And the prosecution is similarly a little bit um, it's a little bit cloudy on this point. So occasionally the prosecutor wants to bring D.H. Lawrence as a author into the conversation. Um, so D.H. Lawrence did have an affair and did break up with his uh, wife. Right. So there's a discussion there of like, OK, he is celebrating this and then he is encouraging other people yeah. to have affairs. But it's not really like named either. But then that changes if you think, well, you know, young working class lads who are at school are not married. So is the claim that we're going to see more divorce or... Yeah. Like, w- what is the anxiety here? And they're also probably not very invested in the, you know, the the author biography of D.H. Lawrence, particularly if they're going along because they've heard about it on TV or in the press and, and they just think, oh, this book might get banned or something. <laughs> yeah. So actually, that that's a really interesting point. That Like, one of the more interesting things here is if, like, if you stop to think about it, are young working class lads or even, you know, wives and servants reading D.H. Lawrence, beyond the fact that it's become this big show trial and everybody wants to read it to see what all the fuss is about. Like, do young people actually learn about sex through, you know, lost literary classics that have previously not been published? And Um, and, and, and Ben, what's the answer? And the answer is... No, of course they fucking don't. Because no one, like, what, what, what a kind of weird assumption. And people do this question, and it's very similar to kind of questions that take place, like, for me, 30, 40, 50 years later. Um, so there's a, a really interesting book that kind of collects the different bits of research. So it's limited research at the time. Um, but they interview uh, 13,528 boys wow. um, conducted by the New York City Bureau of Social Hygiene. And they ask the question, where do you learn about sex? Um, 4% of the boys uh, answer with the question, uh, answer the question with the answer, books. And and I would guess, and I'm saying this as someone who's, whose mother was a, a nurse and a health visitor, so I often had like books about the human body around, like the books that I might learn about, you know, sex and the birds and the bees and things like that would be just, you know, reference books yeah. about the human body. So I'm guessing that they're not even differentiating between 
that kind of book or a novel. Yeah, ex- exactly that. Mm. And yeah, if you are learning about sex from D.H. Lawrence who doesn't know what a clit is, then you should probably be looking up uh, the medical section of your local library. But as always with it, peers parents church like there's lots of influences we, you know people learn about sex from a lot of different places um but literary classics are potentially probably not one of them um again that kind of question of like well okay if we're worried about this book causing delinquency a really interesting way of kind of studying delinquency is to go and find people you know people who are serving time uh, in jail like young delinquents or whatever it is um, and again, they do that study and they go, OK, what are the potential influences for people ending up in a young offenders institute? Um, juvenile delinquency at the time is the phrase. Um, and these researchers find 90 potential influences. And again, the 90 are exactly what you would expect. Um, people coming from um, kind of really poor homes, people coming from a background of you know alcoholism, people where crime runs in the family, people who are kind of attached to get all of those, all of those obvious things. Again, obviously, like books are not identified as contributing factors yeah. to this. I think this is cool research. I think this is interesting research that it's it, it's intriguing for me, you know, 60, 70 years later to be looking back at this and going, OK, people are already making those debates. It doesn't require media studies researchers in the 1980s to ask these questions. Although I am guessing just from the people who conduct in this, if this is the New York City Bureau of Social Hygiene, and you're saying 13,000 plus boys were interviewed, I'm guessing this wasn't just a media research kind of thing? No, it, it, it wasn't. This is very much very well funded. sociology. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, there are some kind of, we can see maybe the, the starting point for kind of some what we would call like media studies or audience research mm-hmm. or reader research or whatever. You can see, um, you can begin to see this starting to take shape and it, it's quite interesting for that. I quite like, I just wanted to name this study just because I think it points out the obvious. Yeah. Um, but there was another study that was done um, that asked young people what an aphrodisiac was for them uh, and they include music dancing, all kinds of scents and perfumes, clothes, and the etc. That etc. is the most prudish etc. that has ever existed in the history of writing. <laughs> it's such an amazing list. Did, did they did they explain what an aphrodisiac was to, to all the people in the <laughs> interview as well? So I imagine something like, is, is this one of these new horrible dances that the young people are doing? <laughs> given all of this, given the number of people that are called by the defense given all of the evidence so the trial lasts for a few days they all um, testify and penguin are found not guilty justice served justice served. it's, it's like um I, it's not a surprise is it given what you've just said but i think um it's it's a bit like you know you, you, so one of the things you said was that the the prosecution didn't call any witnesses but the defence called 35 and they're all like, you know, very respectable experts. Yeah. It's, it's like the end of Miracle on 34th Street, isn't it? When, <laughs> when the, the Royal Mail comes in and it's like, yes, Santa does exist and we've got the proof. You, and, and then that's it. Just case closed immediately. Everyone can go read this weird, not sexy, slightly fascist book. <laughs> Yay! And then be disappointed by it. You'd think that would be the end of obscenity then. We've, we've demonstrated that... Seems like it. This book... Um, doesn't corrupt uh, your servants. Uh, amazing, wonderful, that's the end of that. But that's partly true. It certainly opens up um, the market for a range of other books that are kind of um, able to make the case that they have literary merit. It isn't actually the end of obscenity. Mm. Um, I was surprised while researching this that this this law is still on the books. Um, you and right. I could potentially... Um, be prosecuted under that uh, act on this podcast. Uh, I don't know what we do to do that, but that's something that could potentially happen. Do we need to retract the accents that we did earlier? (laughs) (laughs) Potentially, yeah. Maybe we need to get that Catholic pamphlet and uh, read read extracts from that. I really want to get it. It sounds sounds filthy. I was wondering about, have you ever, uh, this is a bit of an aside, um, but but have you ever read James Joyce's love letters to his wife? I haven't. No. They are the filthiest thing I have probably ever read in my entire <laughs> life, and they were written in like the early 1900s, okay. and they're absolutely exquisite. I'll be popping into Waterstones on the way really, home. Really, really, really funny. I just find them online. So 
in 1971, Oz, which was like a satirical magazine um, of the day, they're put on trial on the same act um, for a front cover that they had that was like they gave guest editorship to kind of kids. Um, and so that became a bit of a... Um, there was there was sections about sex in that. So that, that was put on trial in 71, and they were... The uh, editors and publishers of Oz were found guilty, but that was overturned mm. um, via appeal. Um there's a slow sort of like rumbling in the background of like occasionally, you know, early pornography is put on trial for the same thing uh, inside L- Linda Lovelace, similarly put on trial, not found guilty. So there's this sense that people are expanding outwards up to and including video nasties and other things in, yeah. in the 70s and 80s um, and so on and so forth. The first written material to be charged is much more recent than you would think though um so there was a trial in uh 2009 based on a story a fan fiction story that was published online um by a fella called darren walker um Again, I don't know Darren Walker. I don't know why he published this story. His life gets ruined and dragged through the British press um, as part of this. Uh, He publishes a fan fiction blog. Uh, The title of the story is Girls Scream Aloud. (laughs) Do you want to explain to our listeners who Girls Aloud are first? And then do you want to take a wild stab in the dark about what Girls Scream Aloud is about? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean... If you've not heard of Girls Aloud, I mean, shame on you, really. But it might be an age thing. Uh, Girls Aloud were um, a British pop band girl group who rose to fame on, I think it was Pop Stars The Rivals? It was, yeah. Um, yeah. In, this would have been, what, early 2000s, something like that? Mid. Mid yeah. 2000s, maybe. Um, but yeah, um, so peop- so Cheryl Cole is the most, or whatever her name is now. But um, yeah, um, Cheryl Tweedy maiden name um her, she was the main the most famous one to come out of the group but um yeah I'm, i mean I'm, girls scream aloud that title is gonna be sexy fan fiction about girls aloud or is or have i underestimated or? <laughs> it's the wrong type of screaming it's the uh, vivid description of girls uh, allowed oh, getting murdered, being murdered, yeah, oh. being, uh, being abducted, oh wow, and sexually assaulted and murdered. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> oh Ben, I didn't write it. <laughs> yeah, but you've brought it into the podcast. <laughs> so you've distributed the anecdote. I have uh, distributed to a, a vulnerable uh, young mind. So this is found by the Daily Star. So this is an interesting story because this is in part newspapers of the day going. The internet is going to make disgusting, horrible things available to everyone. So the Daily Star do basically a muck rate through the internet, and this is the worst thing they found. And I'll admit, <sighs> it, it doesn't it doesn't sound great. Yeah. They pass it on to a foundation called the Internet Watch Foundation, um, and then the Internet Watch Foundation give that to um, Scotland Yard, and then Scotland Yard raid um, Darren's home. <laughs> And I, I bet I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to hear his thoughts as he gets a knock at the door and he's like, have you written a horrible blog about Girls Aloud? And he's like, how did you know? And this is my favourite detail. He used his own email. <laughs> so if you take anything from today's podcast, if, if you're writing terrible, horrific fan fiction online, don't use your own email. That's, that's, that's one of the lessons that we could take from this. Darren Walker at btinternet.com. One of those... <laughs> So again, there's something really interesting that happens with this trial. Um, so, spoiler alert, the prosecution drops its case quite early in the trial. Um, but the reason why it drops its case is because they get an internet expert, um, an internet provider expert. So part of the trial was again based on this depravity and corruption of certain groups of people. That was built into the assumptions of the prosecution. Um, so the prosecution thought that this was available on the first page of Google? What? (laughs) Sorry. What? So the assumption is, if an eight-year-old girl who loves Girls Aloud, Googles Girls Aloud, that they're going to get this story and that this was a story that was directed towards them. Oh, God, Ben. Did they not... Did they not do that? Like, Like, 
Did they not try going on Google and searching for Girls Aloud and seeing what comes up? I, I know there's like variations on that and obviously Google's changed a lot over the years so it might have been different than how it is now. But like, I mean, you could disprove that in a matter of minutes. Yes. Yeah, so it, funnily enough, a, a, an academic turns up at the trial and says something very similar of like, well, I Googled it and that, I, I didn't get that. And then they get an internet service provider who's like, that's that's not how Google works. So I think we should say this is 2008. So the internet isn't new, but it's not got perhaps as mainstream reach. as Social media is just about getting going. Just sort of thing. about. Yeah. So I suppose there's an argument that the Crown Prosecution Service, it hasn't fully... Google is still something that's newish to them. But it's a very fascinating... Similarly, for the way the earlier trial is, it's a very fascinating snapshot of a particular historical um, moment. But the point is that this fan fiction, you don't know... uh, You don't get it when you just Google Girls Aloud. You really need to know where to look for this sort of stuff. Um, And that is enough for the prosecution to drop... um, the moment. So it it's interesting to me that that point about depravity and corruption and certain groups of people are being vulnerable and if it's made available to people in the modern version of a mass you know mass paperback which is you know anyone can find it anyone can stumble across it that is enough t- or it was enough to trigger a certain level of it. Yeah. This is the last time anything in print has been um, or this is the last time fiction, I suppose, or fan fiction or whatever it is that we want to call it. This is the last time that has been prosecuted. There are continuing, you know, there's been other things that have been um, successfully prosecuted. I think the Internet opens up some of this stuff. Um, so a similar trial takes place where somebody's messaging someone about child abuse that they want to enact. So there's interesting questions there mm. of like, when does text become fiction and when does fiction become obscenity? Okay. Where he is, he is found that the, the argument that, well, it was just stories doesn't hold when it's kind of interpersonal communication, which I think is an interesting point. Um, so, so what happened to to Derek? You said he was charged under the act, but was he was he found guilty? Like what? no, so yeah, so he's charged. It goes to court, and in the opening days, the prosecution drop drop okay. the prosecution. So he's found not the, the, okay. the judge makes a very deliberate. Okay, you're not guilty. Yeah. Um, it ruins his life. He loses his oh. job as a civil servant. And the Daily Star continue to kind of publish his name about like this sick freak nah. publishing this. Again, I mean, I, it does sound like a horrible story. It does sound like a horrible story. Doesn't sound like a particularly proportionate response. Yes, I, I, yeah. I don't know what Darren's up to today. Um, the, the the press, as the British press tends to do, get very bored of him quite quickly yeah. um, once it's happened. Um, but yes, so that's that's the last time a story was um, put on trial. Okay. We started with the question, does Lady Chatley's lover corrupt your wife and servant? Um, I think this is a fairly straightforward no. <laughs> um, I'd quite I'd quite like somebody to clean my house. But um, beyond that, the idea that this book is corrupting particular groups of people, perhaps not so much. So upcoming birthdays and Christmas presents, I am free to get my wives and servants any book, <laughs> including Lady Chatley's lover. Oh, it's Lady Sword. Chatley's lover again. You got me this last year. <laughs> Um, I think whilst this is a particular moment in time, I think it is interesting because it is an important part of British social history. I don't think it, you know, invents sex and invents the 1960s, but it is clearly a a, a pivot point in changing attitudes. And I think one of the things that these sorts of cases are always interesting for me um, as a historian is that they do give us a kind of a moment in time. They give us kind of a, 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 they capture much bigger, much broader social anxiety, social changes and other things like that. Um, and it distills it into a really pure form. You end up with, like you say, performative, quite absurd, really, like um, older women who were born in Victoria's reign burning the book on the streets. And you have, you know, the young men queuing up to read the book who are going to be doing this at university. So there are interesting moments and it kind of um, visualises bigger, broader social changes that I do think are taking place at this time. I think what's interesting for me, the point about variable obscenity, I suspect that phrase is a phrase that, whether we'll use it in future episodes, it's a phrase that's really kind of important. The idea that certain texts are obscene for certain groups of people Mm. is something that you've indicated earlier in the podcast. 
we still carry this around with us, actually. We still kind of people say, oh, well, I can play Grand Theft Auto, but there's certain groups of people who yeah. perhaps can't play it. Yeah. Um, we don't have that baked into law in quite the same way as perhaps we did in the past, but that idea, I think, is something that we carry um, around with us. And certainly that question of, like, well, which groups of people then are vulnerable to these influences and which groups of people um, are especially um, privy to depravity or corruption. In Britain, in the mid-20th century, that is a conversation about class and gender, mm. I suppose. I don't think it always needs to be about class and gender. I think in different moments, at different points, we'll probably talk about you know race and sexuality and age. There are other things in play here. Um, I suppose the last point is the extent to which affects discussions, which is kind of at the heart of the podcast. The specifics of how this is built into law, I think, is a really interesting question. I hadn't fully appreciated when I was researching this the extent to which actually effects are, are built into British law and continue to be built into British mm. law. Um, so there's something really interesting to me there. And would it be fair to say that the even though the effects and influence are built into the law, we still don't properly have, as part of that law, a way of testing it properly? Like, there's not, there's not like... A, a model for like how we find out if something is going to corrupt or deprave or it always seems to be like a second debate that happens where you say that this thing depraves and corrupts people and rarely in law do you go and do the research to actually have the evidence that this mm. has there's always this kind of assumed idea of who yeah. is reading this even up until like the the girls allow case actually when you kind of look at it they're not actually going and finding out, well, who has read this? What what are the meanings that are attached to this? So there's something really interesting there about the way, you know, the idea of effects is always in play in how we talk about popular culture more generally, but how very little and how very easy it is to lose the actual people who are reading this. Although I'm pleased to hear that, that in both Lady Chatterley's Lover and Girls Scream Aloud case, that they did, that the judges did seem to listen to, you know, experts who were giving evidence about, potential effects and things like that sure yeah and taking them seriously and not just going ah it's, we think it's disgusting guilty <laughs> we're ending on voices again <laughs> i didn't even mean to do one then <laughs> excellent we will wrap up there so thank you for listening if you've enjoyed today's podcast you can like and subscribe wherever you are listening to your podcasts uh, and please also follow us on Twitter and Instagram so if you want to see a nice picture of a book burning or a fella's face who's very excited to be getting hold of the copy of Lady Chatterley's Lover you can follow us on those platforms via Ill Effects Pod that's all for today thank you for listening I've been Ben Liveland and I've been Richard McCulloch see you next time <laughs>